Yo, this is DMC and the place to be and the place for all of y'all to be is deconstructing stigma. Welcome to Mindful Things. I'm your host, Trevor Chamberlain. The Mindful Things podcast is brought to you by the Deconstructing Stigma team at McLean Hospital. Help us change attitudes about mental health by visiting deconstructingstigma.org. So being pulled in different directions uh, for me is probably a uh, good thing. Yeah? You know, because I enjoy that part of it around forensic Uh work. So you enjoy the versatility of it all? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So there's really a balance. Um, The cases that I get involved in doing clinically, right? You know, are really, uh, really interesting to do. So that that variance, I think, adds to it. Adds to the quality. Instead of doing one specific thing, so in DMH, what is DMH? Oh, so the Department of Mental Mental Health. Health. Yeah. There's sort of a forensic division there. And they oversee all these criminal evaluations that are referred from the courts into that system. So those evaluations are really pretty uh, narrow. Uh You know, if you've done one, you've done a hundred already. And what are you, Um, just in generally, what are you evaluating specifically? So in that context, Mm -hmm. with the criminal evaluations, so there's really three main types of evaluations. Again, there's sort of other things that can be done. These are through the court. So this is something that a judge in one of the jurisdictions, depends on the area, Mm -hmm. you know, and they're sort of divided up within the state. And every state's going to be a little bit different on how they uh, manage these things. But a judge will order through uh, statutes. So it's part of the Massachusetts general laws will order evaluations. So an evaluation, um, again, it depends a little bit, sort of a number of variables, but it depends on the complexity, sure. what's going on, the charges. Sure. Uh, the person may be evaluated, the defendant may be evaluated in the court there mm-hmm. by a court clinician, mm-hmm. usually a psychologist, you know, may be right at the court, uh, or the Person, defendant may be referred for an outpatient evaluation. You know, they're released Mm -hmm. uh, on um, bond Mm -hmm. or whatever and told to come back for the evaluation. Or they may be admitted into the hospital. Mm -hmm. It's a Department of Mental Health facility for the forensic evaluation. So it's a different context. Mm -hmm. Now, again, most of what I've focused on, you know, in this area with the criminal evaluations was in uh, the – it's in the inpatient setting. Gotcha. Where, you know, the the patient defendant, mm-hmm. he's, he or she's really not a patient. They're uh, it's a different status, mm-hmm. but they're referred over. Uh, they're not kind of released into the community. They they go from the court directly to the hospital. Right. So that really was my work. Gotcha. Within DMH. Mm-hmm. And um, did you depends. did you enjoy it? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, it was it was interesting, <laughs> to a degree. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, within some obvious limits. Yeah, I think. Um, you know, part of the issue is it's very circumscribed. So those sort of evaluations, um, are there's there's really a pretty rigid format that you follow, mm-hmm. and there's uh, areas that you need to assess and address, and you generate a report based on the evaluation. So it's really pretty rote, you know, going through that. Um, And the reports go back to the court for the judge and both sides to review. Um, But again, once you start doing that work, you know, the cases vary what, you know, what the crimes are, the individuals Mm -hmm. who are involved. But the evaluation is the same. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, like one after another, same sort of evaluations. Mm -hmm. So there's an evaluation for um, ability to stand trial, competence to stand trial. So that's one area. Mm -hmm. And a clinician doesn't actually rule on competence. That's something the judge will decide based on all the information. Mm 
That you provide? Uh, that I provide. There may be other sources, too. The right. judge may have other pieces of information mm-hmm. to make that decision. Um, another evaluation is a criminal responsibility, sort of separate. So if you see this, the competence to stand trial is looking at a person's ability sort of right there, you know, how they're doing at that point to work with, uh, you know, his or her attorney and sit in the courtroom and absorb everything and participate in the trial. Mm -hmm. Criminal responsibility is looking at the process going back at the time the person allegedly committed the crime Mm -hmm. and whether they were responsible in a legal sense for the behavior they did. So this gets really tricky. It varies state to state. Wait, they're responsible for their actions or their behavior? Uh, Well, both. Both, okay. At the time of committing the 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 crime. crime. Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, and again, it varies a little bit state to state, but um, let's get sort of technical. Two areas that are looked at, Mm -hmm. and it's by state law. One is whether a person, a defendant, um, knows what he or she did um, was within the, uh, you know, sort of confines of what the law says. Mm -hmm. So if they were breaking the law that they, you know, they knew, you know, or in the case of being not criminally responsible, that they didn't realize cognitively that they were going outside of the law. So, so they, th- you're trying to determine, or the court's trying to determine, whether this person has an awareness of not just what the law is, but how their actions went outside the boundaries of the law, and whether they're even aware of that. I know you said cognizant, but right, right. Well, so, so, um, yeah, this is more of a cognitive. So they really understand what they did mm-hmm. um, was outside of. Uh, you know, sort of legal, you know, kind of the legal framework, legal limits, you know, um, trying to think of a good example here. Um, If someone is actively uh, pretty seriously ill, mentally ill, Mm -hmm. and let's say based on delusions, um, you know, or or hallucinations, Mm -hmm. there's sort of uh, responding to those, mm-hmm. and and it's pretty clear based on their history, you know that's what's going on. Mm-hmm. Then that may make a case that because of the illness, they were acting in response to that, and just mentally didn't realize they were violating, uh, you know, sort of law, legal limits mm-hmm. around their behavior. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense, mm-hmm. that's sort of a cognitive arm to that. So it's really understanding, appreciating um, the law, and you know, sort of stepping outside of it. If a person doesn't understand that at the time, that may make a case for being not criminally responsible. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you get a lot of criticism for doing this work? Um, <laughs> actually, not uh, no, no, um, not not really criticism. I mean, that wasn't so to much. imply that you're helping putting guilty people on the street. I'm just imagining that there's probably some people from or families or some people from the prosecution that see they want things a little bit more cut and dry. Right. And this acknowledges that there's a gray area. Yeah. And and it's legitimate. Right. And it needs to be it needs to be entered into not even this dialogue. It needs to be entered into this trial. It does play a factor into it. And when people, you know, when family members of victims, they want to see justice. And this gray area that gets introduced kind of changes all of that. Right. Absolutely. So I think where it gets played out is that it can be controversial in some settings. So part of the issue, um, and this has to do with, again, there's there's a variability between different states as far as like state charges go 
and at the federal level. So here's sort of probably the best example of this. Okay. That um, when uh, President Reagan was shot right. at that time, um, there was really a more liberal application of what we're talking about around, uh, you know, sort of um, at the federal level around uh, criminal responsibility and being being adjudicated for that. Didn't I read somewhere in your presentation that the insanity defense or the insanity plea was kind of altered or changed around the time Reagan was shot in order to get a conviction? Am I out of line saying that? Uh, no, no. So, well, it was after, but you're you're on the right track, right? Because um, in that finding, the person uh, Hinckley, right, who did the shooting, was found criminally not responsible. You know, at that time because mm-hmm. of mental illness, and he was sent to the hospital, St. Elizabeth's Hospital, right? At that point, um, but there was a huge outcry. And it was very controversial. And I think because, you know, at the at, in Washington at the federal level, it was sort of a loose application of that, mm-hmm. which meant many more people could be found, you know, for different crimes. It was easier to be found not criminally responsible mm-hmm. or, you know, it's it's also referred to as the insanity defense. Right. But, um, you, you seem to have an issue with – with it being called that, is that not something that should, it should it not be called the insanity defense? Or ins- uh, it is. It's yeah. referred to as that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, just technically, it's more the jargon. Right. You know, uh, criminal responsibility is mm-hmm. sort of the academic. Right. Well, that real. I mean, that's really getting down to the core of it. Yeah. 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 It's well, right. Mm-hmm. It's the responsibility for one's behavior. Sure. You know, actions. But state by state, things vary, and part of this, you know, which. I think it's a little bit interesting Mm -hmm. is um, that there's some link. um, If if this makes sense, I'm not sure I'm presenting this totally clearly. Okay. But there's some link between this area of criminal responsibility and how easy or hard it is to get that, you know, to get a finding of not responsible. I'm sorry, say it again, but in a different way. Like okay. I'm not, yeah, I'm not with you. No, I understand. Yep. So um, that uh, not, it's it's technically called NGRI, so not guilty by reason of insanity. Okay. That area. Right. So um, someone being found not criminally responsible, uh-huh. having that NGRI defense. Right. And that that is uh, found by the court. Mm -hmm. Some states it's easier to do and in other states it's very hard, next to impossible. Mm -hmm. And there's one or two states where it's not even recognized. They don't allow that Mm -hmm. sort of defense. There's some link between whether it's easy or hard to get that defense and the – within a state, societal values – And so there's some association. sounds a little crazy, but there's a little bit of an association with whether it's a red state or a blue state, whether it's more liberal-leaning or conservative-leaning. Actually, okay, so how about this? What about New Hampshire, which has a very, very strong libertarian population? You know, New Hampshire has that whole live free or die thing. I I grew up in New Hampshire, and once I started going out of the country— I, I mean, sorry, you know, leaving New Hampshire and ex- I mean, I've driven across country four times and right. you experience different states. Right. I understand New England's different from Southern California, but New Hampshire has its its, its own strange little thing. It, it, are you I talking like that? Like a different like states have different values. Yes. Yes. So I'm not sure. I'd have to look this up. Yep. I'm not sure specifically about New Hampshire. OK. Um, but. You know, in general, in the Northeast Mm -hmm. area, so potentially New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, um, there's a little bit of a looser definition Mm -hmm. or or should I say a little broader Mm -hmm. application Mm -hmm. of this NGRI defense. Right. But let's say Kentucky. Compared with, yeah, I like to use Texas. Texas, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> they usually, but, that's usually the standard. I wanted to right, try something different, but let's right. go with Texas. Um, 
But there's other states, so I don't mean to pick on Texas, but, you know, there's other states where there's a really much more narrow Mm -hmm. and uh, higher threshold for a finding of NGRI, right? if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I think in part that's based on, you know, sort of different um, values and political viewpoints state to state. But in general, a generalized statement around Mm -hmm. all of this is that overall a insanity defense is still really very hard to prove. Mm -hmm. And that – so my experience, you know, getting back working in Mm -hmm. the Department of Mental Health, Mm -hmm. I would do a ton of these evaluations and – I shouldn't say a ton, but let's say, you know, a couple hundred Mm -hmm. evaluations – And in those numbers, um, I think there were no, uh, not one defendant was found not criminally responsible. None. None. All of them were found responsible Mm -hmm. and then would need to stand trial based Mm -hmm. on that. So – And do you – are you asked from – from different courts from different states that where this NGRI may be applied differently? Do you, do you go and work in different states or are you mostly working New England Massa- or specifically Massachusetts? Right, right. So this is – and again, I'm sort of talking about – this is pretty narrow within the Massachusetts gotcha. Department of Mental Health. Um, I don't do those evaluations mm-hmm. anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, right. But I used to do a lot of them mm-hmm. within Massachusetts. Right, right, right. So every state has its own department of mental health. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, maybe called something a little bit different. Um, every state would do these sort of evaluations. Uh, how they're managed may be totally different between mm-hmm. states, you know, how they're applied mm-hmm. within the court. Mm-hmm. So that's going to really vary. But that work kept me within Massachusetts. Right. Um, I trained, I did some forensic work training in Connecticut and went to court there a few times. Mm-hmm. Um, from what I remember that, that was pretty similar. Mm-hmm. There weren't a lot of differences there. Right. You know, between those two states. Right. I'm sure if I went to some other state, mm-hmm. <laughs> some, some specific states would be different. Right. Well, let's change mm-hmm. gears completely. Be, and get to some some really exciting stuff. And you're writing a book uh, on the concept of the – well, not the concept, but you're writing a, a book on the lone actor terrorism? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So that's a project that I and some colleagues started in the past year. In the past year. And you've been doing presentations on it, and you you sent me over an amazing PowerPoint presentation that I was both unable to understand and actually <laughs> w- got got some really good information from uh, because it's so dense. What <laughs> what what led you into this direction? Were you called into this direction? Did somebody contact you and be like, "Listen, you you and these people, you're the guy for this." Yeah, a- yeah, and and we need to know about this. Right. That would have been nice. <laughs> that's, that's not what happened. No. Um, yeah, basically, um, you know, I think I came about so years ago. So I've been interested more broadly. So within forensic uh, mental health, mm-hmm. you know, I've talked about the clinical work, all those evaluations. Right. And then uh, really – since I started doing that work, I was also interested in very specific areas mm-hmm. involving uh, forensics that, um, you know, there's sort of – it's based more on research and literature. There's sort of a lot of writings, you know. So it's a really uh, pretty um, broad area. There's a lot of uh, research and academic work and lectures, presentations, books within forensic mm-hmm. psychiatry. Um, several years ago, I really shifted into an interest in kind of looking at the relationship between forensic mental health and different areas of national security. And I think that came about, I mean, I sort of know this because I've always been interested in, um, kind of 
politics and international mm-hmm. relations, mm-hmm. sort of a number of areas. And I keep thinking, had I not, you know, made that fateful move to apply to medical school, I probably would have been doing something mm-hmm. well, more you, in this area. You served in the Air Force, yes? I was in the Air Force, yeah, before medical school. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. So I got interested in that area. Mm-hmm. That was unrelated to anything med- mm-hmm. with medicine anyway. But I was in the military, but I always had this interest, you know, maintained an interest in uh, international relations and politics, geography, all of, you know, a number of areas. So I would keep up with reading. And um, basically, um, within this area that I'm talking about with mental health issues, uh, there's sort of a small handful of people who are specialized in that area. Mm -hmm. And they have worked on sort of a number of different projects, different areas within Mm -hmm. this. So one example would be looking at terrorism Mm -hmm. more broadly, you Mm -hmm. know, as one category. Um, Areas around threat assessment, threat analysis, working with law enforcement, you know, locally or the state or Mm -hmm. the FBI. Um, You know, sort of there's some mental health professional psychology, you know, social work, psychiatry that may consult with different agencies, you know, the military or um, Department of Justice or Mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, this is sort of a small subgroup of people who do this work. And basically, as I was reading about it and I started to look into the literature more, I really got into it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, it's sort of a really interesting area to pursue. Mm -hmm. So what I found as I got into these different areas, uh, you know, I thought this whole area of lone actor terrorism Mm -hmm. is really uh, very interesting and evolving. And unfortunately, um, you know, very unfortunately, these cases keep happening periodically. Right. Uh, So they're really pretty destructive when they occur. And so I got really interested, and I sort of knew, you know, these are complicated areas. um, But almost all of these cases have some mental health component to them. But that's not sort of it. It's not just based on mental health. There's a lot of other issues involved. And... um, So really out of interest, I started reading a lot more about this, and that led to, you know, doing some research, putting together material, and then doing posters, presentations, and that led to us developing this idea, you know, to work on this book. Right. I can tell you you right away, just speaking for myself, somebody who suffers from narcissistic personality disorder, is that I – from all the information that that you've sent me and I watched your presentation and I've been reading about this lone actor terrorism is that there there is a narcissistic need to be doing this on your own and and it and it's I I I recognize the behavior it it's it's a bit of I just don't trust anybody to like I want to be I want to be the singular symbol or beacon that people are going to look at when my you know when whatever I do is done yeah With notoriety so that's interesting you know um I think Trevor you're you're getting into the whole area that is being hotly researched that people don't have a good grasp of Mm -hmm. um, around, you know, sort of what's driving this. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's there's a major interest in that. And I think there's a subgroup of people who, um, you know, I think really it's based more on personality or needs. you know, where uh, narcissism may play a role. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that truly is part of it. Um, What I found out in doing this work is that, um, you know, so we've got potentially uh, hundreds of case examples. 
And there are some trends that we're really tracking. And this is sort of a lot of, uh, there's a lot in the literature on this already. This is what we're developing in the book as part of this. Um, so one of the trends is that there's a presence in um, probably, you know, almost every case that I've already reviewed of something clinical going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. But those clinical things are really varied. It's all over the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a uh, personality disorder, you know, or personality. You know, some people it's not condition or anything, but, mm -hmm. you know, they have certain personality traits. But um, there's a lot of examples of substance abuse and major mental illness, mm -hmm. schizophrenia and mood disorders and anxiety disorders and traumatic brain injury mm -hmm. and dissociative disorders. Autism spectrum seems to be coming up in a number of these cases. So that was sort of an interesting finding that when you look at you know, these cases, just clinical load seems to be there in, you know, at least most, a lot of the people right. who do this. Uh, there's been research to show that there's been some, you know, there's sort of, again, not a lot of people are doing this, but there's sort of a small group of people who have done research in this area. Uh, one guy who's one of the authorities uh, world authorities in this area actually is collaborating with us on the book. Oh, that's fantastic. Paul, Paul Gill. Okay. So he's done a lot of research. His area is focused on terrorism. Mm -hmm. So he's that's his whole area. Mm -hmm. um, but basically he's found when, you know, it's fascinating when you compare people who are lone actors or, you know, lone actors or they work with one other person, mm -hmm. let's say. There's examples of that. And people who join groups, mm -hmm. organized groups, there's a much higher rate of mental illness in the lone actor group mm -hmm. compared to the people who go off and join Al-Qaeda or ISIS or something like that. Well, a group has to have a team. You have to have trust. You have to work together. You have to be organized. You have to be able to accept your place in the group, accept your position, and work within those parameters. And you're, I, I've always assumed whenever I've worked at, with a group that we're working towards a goal where he's, and I, I could say this as a narcissist, when I've decided to, you know, go it alone, it's the result doesn't get pushed to the side, but the fact that I'm going to be the symbol for the result weighs just as much. Whereas if I'm working in a, in a group, that really doesn't even matter because we're the, we're the group. Yep. Yep. No, exactly. So there's individuals who just wouldn't make it in a group. Mm -hmm. And with this research that I was talking about, these groups, you know, as crazy as it sounds, so groups like ISIS, mm -hmm. you know, big terrorist groups, they're pretty well organized and they have recruiters mm -hmm. and they look for people who would fit in and they're trying to weed people out who are potential trouble. Mm hmm they don't want. Mm -hmm. So some of these people who act individually, and I can name sort of, we can go over like individual cases. <laughs> right. Yeah. A lot of those people, they wouldn't want in the group because it could jeopardize their group. Right. Um, so it's sort of interesting. I think part of it is these individuals will act um, in part. I mean, it may or may not be narcissism. Mm -hmm. For some of these people, they want to join the group and they, they get kicked right. out. Right, I've heard of that. They wanted to be a part of the group. They get right. pushed out. And so now I'm going to do something that's going to one-up what, you, what you're what you doing. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that could be to outdo. Right. That Now it becomes – uh, there's a competitive nature about, about it. That's yeah. strange. Or to make a name for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that could be really worrisome too. Yeah. And so I think – you know, it's sort of exactly – so there's sort of a number of people who do these manifestos. That mm. seems to come up a lot. Mm -hmm. um, probably a really good example of this is Anders Breivik. Mm -hmm. So he was the guy who committed this major atrocity in Norway 
where he set off bombs in Oslo and then he went to an island and killed yes. a number of uh, teenagers, mm -hmm. you know, in this camp in, uh, in, uh, on this island in Norway. But uh, Brevik, um, sort of a whole interesting history. There's a lot, you know, just to his case. Um, he was ultimately found uh, responsible and serving sentence, but the legal system in Norway is, is much different. Um, but it really turns out, you know, and, and maybe it has to do with uh, really severe narcissism, but something was going on where he really wanted to uh, make a name for himself mm -hmm. and he wanted people to remember him. You know, he sort of represented kind of extremist, right-wing, nationalist views. Mm -hmm. That that was his political view. But, you know, he wrote this manifesto uh, from what I read. He cut and paste a lot of stuff from other people's manifestos. Mm -hmm. And he actually had said, this is in the newspaper, something to the effect that um, what he did, that mass shooting – was basically a uh, publicity move so he could sell his book, which is quite remarkable if you think about it, the number of people he murdered. Mm -hmm. But he wanted to do that in order to guarantee that he'll have sales for his future book. Mm -hmm. Which I guess happened. Uh, I don't think he actually wrote a book. Oh, he never. Oh, <laughs> no. oh! I thought that the book had been uh, published or was about to be published, no. and and he was like, "Well, this will boost sales. This will get me number right. one on Amazon." Or mm. I think maybe uh, maybe he was talking about his manifesto that people would maybe right. hoping oh, the manifesto okay. would be published yeah. and he'd he'd make money out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, he's incarcerated, and you know he'll remain mm -hmm. incarcerated. You know, hopefully forever. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, you know, that's him. I think I was getting off a little bit on a sidetrack mm -hmm. around discussing them. But I think the point is that within this group of lone actors, there's a wide range of clinical issues, but there's a number of other variables that seem to pop up more in these patterns. Right. That's sort of what I found, and some other people have found this um, – so really interesting, kind of a number of things that are, that are really quite interesting. Um, one thing that I found in looking at kind of a subgroup of people is, um, and again, it's not going to be everybody, but there's sort of a subgroup that have been in the military. There was some association with people who were in the military mm -hmm. who just didn't um, function well, didn't make it. And something happened where they either um, got kicked out or their career trajectory took a turn, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for the worse, um, or they failed somehow. Right. That, that pattern seemed to come up in a number of these cases. Um, so Timothy McVeigh. Yeah, I'm glad you're bringing a, him up. Yeah, he's sort of an example where, um, you know, there's this whole literature. So he was in Desert Storm. He actually, f um, I think, fought uh, in Desert Storm. He won awards. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, Terry McVeigh was involved with the Oklahoma City bombing. Timothy McVeigh. Yeah. Oklahoma City bombing, mm -hmm. yeah, in the mid-'90s. Yep. Um, so early-'90s, I guess, 1991. 1991, around that period, was uh, Desert Storm. Desert Storm. Desert yep. Shield, Desert mm -hmm. Storm. He was involved in that. He uh, functioned well at that point. He then wanted to go on as a career in the uh, Special Forces mm -hmm. and failed mm -hmm. out of that and then got out of the Army afterwards. Mm -hmm. And then he got tangled up in extremism. I mean, he may have had some of those beliefs early on, but then— after the military, he started to get involved in the militia movement. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's something I always wonder about. Had he not failed out of the army mm -hmm. and he got on this path that mm -hmm. he wanted to stay on, uh, Oklahoma City may not have happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to predict that. But, you know, it sort of shows this pattern. There's sort of other case examples here 
of people who were in the military or some occupation where um, things sort of deteriorated. Mm -hmm. They they didn't have sort of a productive career getting promoted, Mm -hmm. but they failed out. And that seemed to be a little more prominent Mm -hmm. um, as far as I could tell. No statistics on this, but it just seemed to be one of these variables that Mm -hmm. came up. Jake, I I feel like... I feel like we didn't even scratch the surface. I feel like like when you're driving through the snow and like the snows like like separating across the road, like how it dances. I feel like yeah. that's that's where we got. Right. That's as far as we got. We're so, approaching the surface. Yeah, right. Which is unfortunate because this is this is insanely dense, and I mean insanely in the kindest way. <laughs> this is okay. insanely dense material, and it's all fascinating. And I think what I'm going to request is that you know, given some time, we bring you back and we keep attacking this piece by piece, and. And let's really go through it because there's there's incredible stuff in here. Sure. And I feel like I personally, the narcissist that I am, you know, j- has only the smallest grasp of it. Happy to do it. That'd be great. I'd be uh, happy to come back, talk more about this. Right. And I think there's important areas. You know, you just touched on one area worth talking about more. Cause Absolutely. Because it's another major problem. So. Thank you so very much. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me here today. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you for listening to Mindful Things, the official podcast of McLean Hospital. Please subscribe to us and rate us on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any suggestions for special topics or future guests, email us at mindfulthings at mclean.org. And don't forget, mental health is everyone's responsibility. If you or a loved one are in crisis, the Samaritans are available 24 hours a day at 877 870 Four six seven three. Again, that's eight seven seven eight seven zero four six seven three.